Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the first day of Standard Time. <laughs> and I love Standard Time, I have to say, because there's more light in the morning. So I think I'm an outlier on that. I'm so happy to see you all. We are a welcoming and diverse uh, congregation, and we welcome everyone with all our little individual nuances. So I'm so happy to see everyone. There are certain announcements I need to make. Uh, first of all, we have two bathrooms. Um, as you go down this hallway, the one on the right is a woman's bathroom, and there's a gender ne neutral bathroom, the second door on the left. We have exits should you need to leave rapidly through that door, through the main door in the back, there's a back exit, and a secret stairway right out here. We have certain COVID restrictions, please. At this point, we're all wearing masks all the time. Um, we are, only the choir and Michael are singing, so we are, even though you have hymnals, we are singing with our hearts. And uh, at the very end, when we have our closing, Carry the Flame, we're in our seats standing, and please, you know, feel free to look around because we're still us connecting with us, and that's so important. Because we're speaking with masks, if you don't hear the speaker folks in the back, please signal um, and so that everyone communicates. And my last uh, announcement is about the housekeeping is that uh, from now on, um, you will, if you want a hymnal, please pick it up at the door and then put it away. And also today I'm asking folks to either, you know, pick up a couple of books and put them back on the shelf. Um, I'm finished with the hymnal task. Yes, yeah, Sal? I have an announcement. Is this an okay time? Sure. All right. Real quick, everybody, and I'm speaking for the pastoral care committee. We're hoping to um, get a uh, mic. Uh, right. Hi. Uh, speaking for the pastoral care committee, we are working to get back into uh, having a caring, a more of a caring connection committee again. But it's it's going to be called the UUCSC Helping Hands, and we're working very hard to. Um, make it possible to help some people when they need to get rides here and there for, for appointments and to um, receive uh, food when they come home from a hospital stay of some sort or in that kind of need. So if you are into giving rides because you like to drive around and help that way, please give me your name and we'll, we'll add you to the list. And if you like to make an extra meal for someone now and then, we have people who have really received so much, so much love and care from our congregation through these small acts. And please come to me and one of the other pastoral care committee members to um, give us your name and help us get more people getting more help. Thank you. Hi, there's a single seat over here, right here on the edge. Great. I want to introduce our speaker today, David Caruso. Am I saying that right? Caruso? Yes, yes such a nice Italian name. Um, David it has been a, well, first of all, David was one of the founders of this congregation. Um, and so he's actually returning to South County. And I hope those of you who were around in the old days will come and greet him, especially at the end of this service. He has been uh, involved with the Japanese Soto School of Zen for 50 years, and he is a priest in that lineage. Uh, he and his wife, Sarah Hunt, uh, again, were founders of UCSC. Is, is that Sarah? 
Is that Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Nice to, nice to see you, if not actually meet you. And, uh, and so David's been involved uh, with Buddhism for half a century. This is, so this is the upside of getting old, is that you've done things for 50 years. So I, I actually appreciate that. Um, today is also we share the plate, and before the offertory, I will tell you more about that. Uh, share the plate, and we're set. The opening words today are from The Authentic Gate by Kaun Yamada. Yamada was a 20th century Japanese business executive who began Zen training at age 38. Later, as head of the Senbo Kankyodan, he was instrumental in bringing Christians into the practice of Zen meditation. It's called Compassion Unbound. Just as sunshine breaks through clouds, the compassionate light of our essential nature shines through the cracks in our delusion. Compassion unbound naturally flows out beyond duality. It is absolute and universal love, the compassion of the one body. As we gradually clarify the heart's eye, the eye that sees the absolute, we more and more clearly experience this unbound compassion. We come to love everything with immeasurable depth, and we know that all things completely love us. This naturally opens a life of intimate gratitude and peace. May the light of this chalice remind us of the light and love within each of us. May we, may we share this light with all sentient beings. Please rise, embody your own spirit for our covenant. Love is the spirit of this congregation and serves as its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace.
to seek the truth in love and to help one another. This reading is by Wendy Egyotru Nakao, who served as the abbot of the Zen Center of Los Angeles and is now abbot emeritus. Under her leadership, the Zen Center expanded its mission to be much more family-friendly and socially active. This is a responsive reading. So uh, I will read the lines that aren't bold and italicized. It's on the back of your order of service. So if you flip it over, you'll see lines that are bolded and italicized. Those are for you. I'll read the other lines, and we'll uh, read this together. It's called, A Blessing for the Journey. Let us vow to bear witness to the wholeness of life, realizing the completeness of each and everything. Embracing our differences, I shall know you, I shall know myself as you, and you as myself. May we serve each other for all our days, here, there, and everywhere. Let us vow to open ourselves to the abundance of life. Freely giving and receiving, I shall care for you, for the stars and trees, as treasures of my very own. May we be grateful for all our days, here, there, and let us vow to, for to forgive all hurt caused by ourselves and others, and never condone hurtful ways. Being responsible for my actions, I shall free myself and you. Will you free me too? May we be kind for all our days, here, there, and everywhere. May we give no fear for all our days, here, there, let us vow to remember, all that appears will disappear. In the midst of uncertainty, let us so love. Here, now, I call to you, let us together live in peace.
Hi everyone, I'm so thrilled to be here with you today. I'd like to share some thoughts about the Zen Buddhist approach to developing a life embodied with wisdom and compassion. In exploring these ideas, I'll review the findings of evolutionary brain science and how this contemporary research shows a very uh, refined collaboration and corrob corroborates the insights into the human mind that are at the heart of the teachings of a man who lived long ago. For over 25 centuries, he has been known as Buddha, the, the awakened one. But he was actually a person just like you and me. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he lived a life much like ours. As a young man, he was in an educated and well-to-do family. By today's standards, you'd probably think of him as an upper-middle-class person. But he, as he grew into adolescence and young adulthood, he became deeply concerned about what he saw in his community, suffering, sickness, anxiety, worry, discontent, violence, anger. He was aware when he left his well-to-do household of these ubiquitous human challenges. So perhaps with the passion of unbridled self-confidence that you often see in young people, he decided to see if he could do something about this. After years of seeking and searching, of following prescriptions of various gurus and spiritual traditions, he simply sat down under a tree in deep meditation with the vow not to move until he discovered the answer to these issues for himself. In that way, through inquiring within himself into his own mind, he had his great awakening and spent the next 40 years wandering among the villages and towns, teaching about what he had discovered. There's a story about a Native American elder retold by Rick Hansen in his book, Buddha's Brain. She, asked how she, had, she was asked how she had become so wise, so happy, and so respected in her community. And she answered, in my heart, I have two wolves, a wolf of love and a wolf of hate. It all depends on which one I feed every day. This little tale captures a key aspect of Buddha's teaching and is congruent with everything we know from evolutionary brain science about us, human beings. About what we might call human nature. For many centuries after the life of Buddha, his followers developed and taught methods for attaining awakening, or uh, sometimes called enlightenment, through scriptural study and monastic practices that were expected to require many lifetimes, many, many lifetimes to achieve final nirvana. The focus was on individual attainment of enlightenment to end individual suffering. But during the second century CE, about 600 years after Buddha lived, some Buddhist scholars and monastics renewed and expanded Buddhist teachings by looking directly back, back to what Buddha himself taught. This branch of Buddhism came to be known as the Mahayana, a term meaning the great vehicle, the vehicle with room for everyone. The core concept of Mahayana teachings is that a person does not attain enlightenment for oneself alone, but rather for all sentient beings. The core concept is a potent aspect of what came to be uh, Zen Buddhism, later developing in China and Japan. Mahayana Buddhists taught that, just like the historical Buddha, awakening can be attained in a single lifetime and can be accomplished by anyone. This is called the path of the Bodhisattva, that Sanskrit word means one who seeks enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. 
In this Mahayana tradition, there is a story that's told about the Buddha that goes like this. After his great awakening, Siddhartha walked to a nearby stream. He sat down on the bank and had a drink. And as he was sitting there, several of his friends came by and remarked, wow, you look especially radiant today. What happened? Siddhartha, with one finger, touched the earth beside him and said, today I and all sentient beings were awakened. This is the root core of Buddhist teachings that inextricably links wisdom and compassion. So we could use that wise Native American woman's metaphor and say that the Bodhisattva path that is taught in Buddhism is the way to actualize the wolf of love in our lives and in doing so to quiet the wolf of hate. Zen Buddhism grew from within this Mahayana tradition with a singular focus on the Bodhisattva way, on attaining enlightenment in this lifetime for the benefit of all beings. In the practice of Zen, we learn to feed the wolf of love every day, and we realize that the wolf of hate is always within us, waiting for a bit of nourishment to materialize. And we all know, all of us, that the wolf, when the wolf of hate is fed, it is very powerful indeed. <laughs> How is it that over millions of years of evolution, we have been bequeathed with, as human beings with a mind system that consists of both wolves? Well, the first primates evolved over, well, let, let, let me get this right. The first primates evolved from earlier uh, animals over 80 million years ago. Our evolutionary ancestors, these early primates, ensured their continuation as a species in large part through their defining characteristic of great sociability. In fact, the great apes, of which we are one, the great apes have the most powerful traits of sociability of all primates. Great apes include chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and us, homo sapiens. For example, all great apes console other members of their troop who are upset, and chimpanzees even laugh and cry. We now know through brain research that all great apes have evolved spindle cells within their brains, a remarkable kind of neuron that supports great social capabilities. Of all the vertebrates on Earth, only great apes have spindle cells in their brains. This gives us empathy, love, attachment, cooperation, and many other positive emotions that lead to social traits. But our powerful sociability trait also has a downside, the wolf of hate side. That's been bequeathed to us by evolution as well. The survival of all primate species, including great apes, like us, and our early hominid ancestors, dependent on loyalty and protection and love of us and hostility, fear, and aggression toward them. For millions of years, the harsh conditions of starvation, predators, and disease created the characteristics of our species' brain-mind system. It was reproductively advantageous for our ancestors to be loving, cooperative, and kind within their own small band or group, and aggressive, toward others. In fact, cooperation and aggression <coughs> evolved synergistically. Think of it this way. Groups who had more cooperation were more successful at aggression. And aggression between groups demanded cooperation within groups. So it was a mutual like feedback system as these two characteristics evolved and became part of the brain-mind system of all primates, and especially humans. 
Within our brains, cooperation and love draw on multiple and complex neurological systems, and so do aggression and hate. Today, through sophisticated brain research, we have a pretty clear picture of how this system works, both the love, cooperation, and caring system, and the aggression and hate system, the two wolves. Now, it's not my purpose today to go into the detail of these findings from brain research, um, but only to illustrate what each of us really knows from our own experience. We have within us the wolf of love and the wolf of hate. We can't wish that fact away or pretend that the wolf of hate is not within us. This is our human nature. The question is, given human nature, how do we actualize a love, of, a life of love and compassion? This is what the Buddha's teaching focused on after his great awakening. Buddha taught that the fundamental underlying cause of our suffering, of the pervasive feelings of anxiety, worry, anger, unhappiness, dissatisfaction, uh, all grow from our clinging, our deep desire to hold on to our separate selves and those things that please us. But in actual reality, in actual reality, we are interdependent with and interpen interpenetrated by everyone and everything and all things, including us, are transient and impermanent. That's why our clinging causes us to suffer again and again. And this suffering feeds the wolf of hate. Buddha taught a path to awaken to and accept this actual reality of interconnectedness and impermanence and free ourselves from the suffering caused by our sense of separateness and loss. The amazing thing is that when one realizes the wisdom of this understanding of the true nature of reality and actualizes it in their life, unbound compassion, arri unbound compassion arises of its own accord. Wisdom and compassion are inextricably linked. This is compassion unbound as Kaun Yamada described in the first reading I shared earlier. Yeah, he said, Compassion unbound flows naturally out beyond duality. It is absolute and universal love, the compassion of the one body. This compassion unbounded is not delimited by particular events or people or groups. Unbound means this Compassion is not constrained or restricted by anything, nor is there a limit to its reach. So awakening to the true nature of reality feeds and empowers the wolf of love. The wolf of love sees a vast horizon with all beings included within the circle of us. Say that again all beings included within the circle of us. For the wolf of hate, that circle shrinks down so that only included within us is perhaps the nation or the ethnic group or even just the family and friends of an individual. As soon as you place anyone outside of the circle of us, our mind system, because of evolution, this is, what, this is our nature. As soon as you place anyone outside the circle of us, the mind automatically begins to devalue that person or type of person and justifies poor treatment of them. You have begun to feed the wolf of hate. Um, I'll just end this talk uh, 
with a, a few comments about those of us who, who uh, spend their life practicing Zen uh, Buddhism. So in the life of a, of a Zen Buddhist, we say we engage in Zen practice. We practice Zen a little bit like uh, practicing piano or ballet. We don't say, I am a Zen Buddhist, but rather, I am a person who practices Zen. By the way, Zen is a Japanese term. It simply means meditation. So if you said, I do Zen meditation, you're actually saying, I do meditation meditation, <laughs> which is a little silly. This is because even with great awakening to the nature of actual reality and the emergence of unbound compassion, we recognize and accept that actual reality includes the wolf of hate. It's within us. That is because, just as the Native American elder said, we have to feed the wolf of love and starve the wolf of hate every day, over and over. So through our experience of Zen meditation and our commitment to acceptance of the interconnectedness and impermanence of all things, we feed and nurture the wolf of love over and over again. And the wolf of hate recedes and is greatly diminished. We know we cannot destroy the wolf of hate, for it is part of us, part of human nature. But through our practice, we can keep it tethered and limit its alarm, self-righteousness, grievances, and resentments, its contempt, and prejudices. We then allow the wolf of love to flourish, and accepting all things, we empower compassion unbound to flow through our lives to all sentient beings. This is the, this is the bodhisattva path of Zen Buddhism, of Zen practice. So there, there are a number of uh, stories about what the Buddha uh, supposedly said on his deathbed to his followers. There's one, though, that I like best, and it is, he said very simply, be kind to one another. sung by the choir will be We'll Build a Land.
there's a little typo in your order of service. The closing words were written by Larry Yang. Larry teaches at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Northern California and has a special interest in creating access to Buddhist teachings for diverse multicultural communities. It's called Aspiration Prayer. May I be as loving in this moment as I can. If I cannot be loving in this moment, may I be kind. If I cannot be kind, may I be non-judgmental. If I cannot be non-judgmental, may I not cause harm. And if I cannot cause harm, may I cause the least harm possible. We extinguish this chalice, but not its light, that we take with us out into the world, sharing it with those we encounter on our journey. Please rise and sing in your hearts, but stay in place for our closing song. <laughs>